Okay. All right, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Ebony McDonald. I am the African and African American Studies Diversity Librarian here at LSU Libraries. And today we're going to, uh, I have uh, three professional researchers joining me to host this chat and chew. As we know, it is Black History Month and I thought African American genealogy, I thought we'd do a program on genealogy in general and then talk about some of its uh, <laughs> limitations. So uh, just to get started, I'm, I have my little introduction here, put us all on the, the, the same place. Um, okay, so who am I is a complicated but frequently asked question that can require a lifelong process to answer. Genealogy, the study of family history and lineage contributes to this universal search of the self by painstakingly stitching together a person's ancestry, primarily relying upon oral histories and public records, such as those from the census, military, and vital records like birth, marriage, and death certificates. Since many historical records are limited by the conditions in which they have been created, not all stories can be easily told. While some people may find their family histories illuminated through several millennia, others may discover that theirs barely seems to be captured beyond a century ago. Recently, we have seen certain socio-political conditions impact the creation of public records with the debates about including a citizenship question in the 2020 census. The legal challenges to excluding undocumented immigrants from the count and a subsequent plan to end counting earlier than scheduled. Considering the disparity within the public's historical memory between those who have existed and those whose existence has actually been documented through records, is it really possible for everyone's ancestral story to be told, especially by relying on historical public records? If so, how does one begin to do so? More importantly, why are some stories readily available while others are nearly excluded? In today's chat and two, we are going to discuss historical identity and public memory as they relate to the practice of genealogical research. I am going to let the panelists introduce themselves by asking them to tell me a little bit more about who you are what you do, and why. So I guess I'll go to Greg first. Hi, everybody. My name is Gregory Osborne. Uh, I work at New Orleans Public Library. I work in the city archives and special collection section. So if you're going to do your genealogy and your family's from New Orleans, we are the number one place for you to get started, to do your research because of our uh, historical newspaper collections, uh, court records, wills, successions. Um, we also have records of mayors and city council and basically city agencies. So we're the place. Um, but uh, one, I guess one of the reasons why I'm on this panel was I was fortunate to be a research assistant for Dr. Gwendolyn Menlo Hall back in 1991. And um, I'd gone to Stanford in California, which is where I'm from originally. Um, and when I graduated, um, a professor there told me of Dr. Hall's research on looking at African origins of people brought to Louisiana in the uh, 1700s, 1800s, and I was able to meet with her and ask her for a job. And that's what led me from LA to New Orleans, which is where my dad is from. Um, so that's really, but I've been doing genealogy since I was 12 and started uh, talking to a great grandmother, a great great aunt. Um, I was able to talk to all my grandparents, except the grandmother from here, unfortunately, she died in 77 when I was 11. So um, 
we're going to talk about oral history, but that's where you get started. But we'll talk about census and vital records, court records. But um, I'll, I'll stop there and, and let my other panelists introduce themselves. Judy? Well, my name is Judy Riffle. I'm a professional genealogist. And like a lot of professional genealogists, it started out as a hobby. Like Greg, I was a teenager, a little bit older, a teenager when I got interested in my family history. Um, and it just grew from there. And as we get older in life, I think we it becomes more of a more than a hobby. In my case, I'm, I'm a professional and I do work for hire. I have clients, big clients, and then individuals who just want to uh, trace their great, great, great grandfather or know something about an ancestor. So I, I specialize in Louisiana research, Louisiana ancestors, and um, I, I do uh, a lot of research in the archives and libraries in Louisiana. So I do a little bit of everything. Last but not least, David. Hi, my name is David Lotch, and I'm the genealogy librarian at the East Baton Rouge Parish Public Library, and we're located on Goodwood Boulevard, uh, right in Independence Park there. Um, I got my library degree from LSU in 2012, and I've started working in the genealogy department in 2016, uh, mostly because I, I specialized in special libraries, and this is the special library within the uh, East Baton Rouge Parish Library. Um, my interest in genealogy really kicked off after I started working here. I just started doing it and it became more and more interesting as I discovered more and more and got you know, further back in my past. Um, our collection here at the library, we specialize in Southern Louisiana records, mostly East Baton Rouge Parish, but we extend across Southern Louisiana. Uh, we're really for like beginners and intermediate researchers, I think is where I would place ourselves because we, really provide lots of instruction. That's really our specialty. One-on-one -on -one instruction, we'll sit down with people as they come in and we are socially distanced. We have that all taken care of. And we will sit with you for an hour and show you how to do it, what to do, help you find resources, help you locate resources, help you make the intuitive leaps that you need to do to move back in genealogy. And we have a pretty good staff here. I've, we've been working together as a team for about two years in the team I have now. And so we're really prepared to help anyone who's interested in coming in and learning the basics and getting started and getting to you know, the second level in their research. Okay. So uh, all three of you work in essentially public service with the genealogy. Um, what are some frequent motivations for people who desire to do genealogical research? Um, a lot of people, well, they're the people who are trying to um, get into uh, lineage societies, the DAR, the SAR, the colonial dames, et cetera, et cetera. That's one big motivator for people. And then I think another big motivator, spoken or not, is uh, the essential rootlessness that we have in America. Where did I come from? Who did I come from? How did my family get here? which is not a question that you have in other countries. I was speaking to a Japanese person and she said, this, this question is just completely lost on Japanese people. They're just Japanese. Um, but in America, you know, there's this cultural and social blending that's been going on. And my motivation anyway, is to sort of pick apart, how did people come here? When did they come to the United States? Why did they come to the United States? And how did they meet up to make me basically, that, that's, that's been my driving motivation, so. Okay. So uh, just really quickly for those who do not know those societies you named by um, the initials. What... The, the Daughters of the American Revolution is, uh, and the Sons of the American Revolution are, they're called lineage societies. They're clubs basically for people who can trace an ancestor back to people who fought in the Revolutionary War. Um, there are other lineage societies, but those are the two really big ones. Um, and a lot of people are trying to get, try to get into those societies and you have to do a lot of very, 
very specific genealogical research to get into those. And so that, that's a motivation for people. So. Okay. And Judy or Gray, do you want to talk about the motivations of your uh, patrons and clients that you've worked with? Well, um, I think a lot of people are just curious about their families and want to know something about maybe one person in particular. Um, some of us have a fascination with certain family lines. I know men tend to be more interested in their paternal lines than, than the maternal lines. So they always want to go back to the first person with that surname. So it, it, it varies from person to person, uh, what they wanna know. I think some of us have favorite ancestors that we wanna know more about. They may have done some initial research themselves and um, they hit a brick wall and they just want some help uh, with, with a specific project or problem that they have. So it varies from person to person. Okay. Greg? Um, for, for us, it's because New Orleans is so old, <laughs> so steeped in history. It's, um, when I'm not at the library, I do tours of the old cemeteries. So, well, this was pre-COVID, but um, New Orleans has such a sense of place. The history is sort of layered uh, because we were founded by the French and then we were Spanish, uh, Africans have been here very early and then the Native American population and then being a port city. Uh, so uh, connections to the Caribbean like Haiti, Guadalupe, Cuba, and then Central and Latin America. And then um, thousands of Irish, Germans, Italians, and other Europeans came in, uh, you know, so we got a, a, a large portion of Irish um, con contrasted to Boston or New York or the East Coast. Uh, and then we were a gateway city. So your ancestors, ancestors may have arrived in New Orleans and took a boat up the river. So they might have been here days or weeks and then went up to Minnesota or Missouri or, you know, because if you're going to the upper Midwest, you were going to go to New Orleans and take a steamboat. You weren't going to go to Boston and take a train or, you know, you'd have to take another boat to go through the Great Lakes. So New Orleans has a very strong uh, transportation connection uh, with the river and also with the Caribbean and Latin American ports. So. So yeah, as David said, and I'm from California, you know, the original people there are Native American or Spanish, but um, both my parents were not natives of California. They were, my mother was from Port Arthur, Texas, and my dad was from Algiers, New Orleans. And so my roots are here, my roots are other places. And so moving here in 91 has been really helpful to explore my own roots. Okay. And so, how does one get started with genealogical research? I decide I'm, I'm going to discover my family lineage. What specific information points do I need to consider? Perhaps some resources, tools, and costs since I'm doing it myself? Well, if you're starting at the public library, it should be free. Uh, let's start there. Um, uh, I recommend people First thing you do is talk to your family, get the oral histories, go through those old trunks that you have in the attic or under the bed and look for pictures and Bibles and things like that that may have information written on the back. And then from there, once you get those people, try to find people who were born before the 1940 census. And then we can start using census records that you find online at a website like Ancestry or family search. And just so you know, Ancestry, at least through the end of March is free through the, with your public library card. So there shouldn't be any cost to that. Um, and then from there, you can sort of start, start to piece it out. But yeah, I recommend doing that and then coming to the library with that information if you don't know what you're doing. And then we can kind of guide you and show you 
where to find resources and how to use them to put together a, a bigger family tree. Okay. Well, if your family is from Louisiana, another place you want to uh, visit is the Louisiana State Archives. Uh, they have uh, vital records there, the historic vital records, what's public, uh, that would be death certificates, 50 years or older, uh, birth certificates 100 years or older for Louisiana. So that's a really good resource and, and it's free. Of course, they charge for copies if you wanna make copies or you can bring a flash drive and make scans for free. So um, that's a really good resource if your family's from Louisiana. Okay, I do have a question here, David. Um... Could you please elaborate on Ancestry.com being free? Okay. Uh, uh, the library subscribes to a Ancestry Library Edition, which is it gives you access to all the records Ancestry has, but you can't build your family tree on it. Um, but due to the pandemic, typically it's in-house only. You have to come into the library to use it with your library card. But due to the pandemic, uh, the people at ProQuest who run the database have been gracious enough to grant free access from home. You go to the library website, you go to the digital library, you then go to ancestry.com and then put in your library card number and then you can use that website for free to look up records. Okay, yes, I'll, I'll, I will. And that's through the end of March that we know of. It may extend beyond that, I'm sorry. Yes, I'll, uh, at the end of this, I'll provide some, some links to resources as well as uh, make sure Percy at all has has them if you if you are attending this and, and want more information. So um, okay, so uh, I'm seeing. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna come back back around to questions once once we get through the the the, the panel just in case it's answered. Mm -hmm. um, so it sounds like. Uh, genealogical research takes a lot of time. What if I'm a very busy person who is interested in my family history, but I just don't have time to do it myself? What are my options? I'm gonna let Judy answer that one. <laughs> I recommend you do it yourself because it's, it's very enjoyable and satisfying, but um, I, I am sort of the so resource of last resort. If you can't access records here in Louisiana, uh, let's say you're up in Minnesota somewhere and you can't come down here right now and you need boots on the ground, I'm the person who uh, you can try to get to go, of course, during non-pandemic times, to go to uh, libraries and archives and courthouses and look up records that are not readily available on the internet. But there is a lot on the internet now, not just at Ancestry, but in free uh, websites like Family Search, uh, which is the um, Mormon website, and it's free. Uh, they, uh, for the last several decades, they've digitized a lot of records. Um, they may not be indexed, but they are there. Um, and you can search them like you would if you went to that library or archives. Um, it just, it does take some time to do that. And you have to sometimes read, hard to read handwriting and foreign languages and things like that. But um, it, I think it is, it's possible to do it yourself in your spare time if you have some patience. <laughs> so um, it sounds like it is possible to encounter some uh, difficulties doing whether you're doing it yourself or whether someone, Judy, is, has hired you to do it. Um, are there any particular groups that may have a harder time with this type of research than others? If so, why? And um, what kind of strategies should people of these groups employ to overcome those barriers? All right. Well, I guess. Uh, if you're doing African American research and you're doing, you have enslaved ancestors. So um, for African Americans, you are going to rely on the federal census because that was done every 10 years. And the most recent available census is 1940. In fact, that was the first census that both my parents were listed 
um, because my dad is the youngest of seven. Um, and my mother was just, she, it's her and her sister. Um, and they were born both in the 30s. But when I, when I, I had interviewed a great grandmother who was born in 1892, I could find her at eight years old uh, in 1900 in Bienville Parish. Uh, and she was listed with her parents. And then, you know, so once you find someone who you personally knew or know about and find them on the census, you can trace them back from 40, 30, 20, 10, 1900, 1880, 1870, because uh, 1870 is the first federal census where everyone is listed regardless of race. Before that, 1860 and 50, it's only free people and slaves only by age, color, and number, uh, sex. It's not, they're not listed individually un until after emancipation in 1870. So that's, that's about 70 years right there from 1870 to 1940. And you're gonna find several generations of your family, particularly if they were from one place, and tended to be from one place for a while. Um, and then finding death certificates uh, after 1914 for New uh, Louisiana, for people who might've been born enslaved. You know, they died in the 20s and 30s and hopefully their parents are listed. Um, so yeah, so you can rely on vital records, uh, census records, and, um, you know, marriage records as well. They start, um, well, for people enslaved in um, post-Civil War during Reconstruction. Now, LSU Special Collections has many plantation records. Um, have any of you uh, used plantation records to help with Af African-American research or other types of genealogical research? I have uh, quite a bit. I've spent a lot of time at LSU looking through some of those papers. Um, they're, I would say, more of an advanced source um, because they're not very, there are very few indexes. There are some finding aids and uh, if you're looking for a particular person, it's very difficult, though. You have to look through pages and pages in uh, trying to find uh, a person. So uh, they're, they, they're excellent records, but they're very difficult to use because of the lack of indexes, name indexes. OK. Um... Just thinking of, of, of other types of, of, of dif difficulties that one m might face, uh, does location, uh, can location impact the types of available records uh, wh where your family was located? I know, Greg, you, you kind of mentioned this. Um, like, are there any strategies one might consider when researching records pertaining to um, Northern Louisiana versus Southern Louisiana or, um, Baton Rouge versus New Orleans. Well, here in South Louisiana, sorry, uh, here in South Louisiana, the Catholic Church um, is predominant in our history, and the Catholics kept very good uh, sacramental records. That would be baptisms, marriages, and burial records. Uh, so even though our state vital records don't go back that far outside of New Orleans, the Catholic church records will go back into the 1700s in some cases. So if your family's from South Louisiana and they were Catholic, you, um, you have a better chance of tracing your family back into as far as colonial times. And, and to add to that, the Catholic church also required plantation owners to baptize their slaves. So there are lists of uh, people born without surnames or baptized without surnames that are also included in these records. So you can, in some cases, find enslaved people in those records, even though they wouldn't be listed by their full name. So. 
that it, it can be a resource for African-Americans. More difficult to use, of course, as is anything in genealogy for African-Americans. But yes, it, it, it is there. Okay. And the next question um, I have, just, I feel like genealogy in, in the last five years or so has become more prominent in, in the forefront of people's minds because of all these commercialized genetic genealogy services. So how does ge the, the genealogical research that you do differ from these commercialized databases um, by organizations such as like 23andMe? It, it's another tool, basically. Um, what when I did my test, I had done a great deal of background research to locate my family. And then I took the test to sort of fill in the gaps to help me out because you receive not only your ethnic matches, you know, your ethnicity percentages, which is what they advertise because you know that's showy, but you also get a list of people that you match with who've also taken that test with a strength of match. Like you, sh I sh share, 8% of DNA with this person and 15% with that person, et cetera, et cetera. And then I can sort of figure out how I'm related to those people and sort of fill in gaps that are missing or use those to point me in directions that I hadn't thought of going before. So that it, it's another tool basically in the toolbox. Also one that I advise you if you're going to do it, uh, think very carefully about what you might find, because I have had cases of people coming in uh, where nobody on their, who they thought was their father's side of the family was actually on that list, but there were people they'd never met before. Mm. Yeah, so there is always the possibility of a nasty surprise. So right. just, be, just be careful, yeah. yeah. Well, the DNA is a tool that adoptees are using now to find their birth parents and, mm -hmm. and relatives, siblings. Um, so it's, it's very helpful to them when the records are closed to them to test on these services and see who their closest matches are and to find their birth parents that way. Yeah, I did that. My wife is adopted and I found her birth mother that way. Yeah. And um, so it sounds like it's it's useful for, as you said, filling in the gaps. What are its limitations in your experience? Well, first of all, not everybody is tested. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there are, in what you're using to fill in the gaps, there are enormous gaps. So but yeah, that's, that's the big one that I've found. Okay. Um, all right. Here's um. So we did have a question. I just I'm I'm going to read this question in case there's more uh, to cover in this area. Um, what are the best strategies for pairing the public records for genealogy with DNA ancestry testing? If you're if you're doing it yourself. Well, the two go hand in hand. Um, it's not an either or. Um, I use the DNA in many of my cases to confirm what I found on the paper trail. Yeah. Sometimes I use it to give me clues, but mostly I use it to confirm what I found. Maybe that is a little bit on the eh, iffy side. Uh, like if I have somebody with a common name like John Smith, do I have the right John Smith? So that's when, you know, I use the DNA to help confirm that as it's just another resource. Um, it's not magic and it's not going to give you all the answers. You've still got to do the hard research, find the documents and, and piece it together, um, piece together the evidence as a whole, not just look at the DNA and expect that you're going to get the answer. You've still got to do the hard research. Okay. All right, so 
can't get, as we like to tell students when it comes to doing research, you can't get out of the work. <laughs> it's just, it's just work. Um, you know, we, can, we can tell you how to make it a little bit easier, but you just can't get out of the hard work. It's just hard work. That's what it is. Um, so I'm going to ask this last question, and then I'll turn it over to the audience. I'm sure there are people who, who have their own personal questions. Um, Tell us about the most interesting genealogical project or request in which you that that you've been involved in. The most interesting. Um, right now, actually, we're doing something very interesting. We're working on uh, tracing the lives of free people of color in Baton Rouge before, during, and after the Civil War. And so we've been, uh, and I, me and the archivist here have both been working on, you know, finding out who these people are, what they did, how they made their money, how they lived, you know, when they registered to vote, when they were kicked off the, the voter rolls, um, those sorts of things. So that, that's, that's been an interesting project we've been working on. Well, for me, a little over five years ago, I was contacted by uh, a Georgetown University alum who wanted to um, find out what happened to some 272 enslaved persons that were sold by the Jesuits in Maryland and sent to Louisiana. And he hired me um, to see if we could find descendants. And um, it was supposed to be a few months long project and it's now five years and plus and counting. And we've located thousands and thousands of descendants here in Louisiana and all around the country who are descended from this group of enslaved people who were sent to Louisiana and put on plantations in uh, South Louisiana. So it's been a very interesting project. Yes, I believe that there was a, a, a collaboration between an honors college course and uh, our oral history center uh, to help with uh, uncover that project. And I believe there's also a, a film, a documentary about it. I can, I can think for a while and, and get the name of that if, if anyone's interested in seeing more about that. Two, I think it was called the 200 and 272 Project here. Um, was also featured on Henry Louis Gates's uh, PBS program, Finding Your Roots. The actress S. E. Patha Markerson is a GU 272 descendant, and mm -hmm. uh, he revealed that to her on his program, which comes on Tuesday nights, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I recommend it. It's, it's actually quite good. Yeah, it doesn't gloss over or simplify things for you. So, there are resources in the chat if if you're not looking in the chat. So I just dropped the link in there from the Honors College about uh, LSU's contribution to the two two seventy two. You said GU two seventy two uh, project. And Greg, what... I'd say for me it was um, moving here in ninety one and working with Dr. Gwendolyn Middle Hall. Um, one of our fellow researchers was uh, Ulysse Ricard, uh, who worked at Amistad uh, for many years um, and had traced his own family. His family were from Point Coupee and West Baton Rouge, uh, free people of color. And, you know, we got to go to all these archives, courthouses. Uh, state archives and just uncovering the, that rich documentation. Louisiana is so rich as far as uh, documentation on their enslaved population, their European population, just because of the French and the Spanish uh, record keeping, like, and the Catholic Church. So even, you know, it's not universal that enslaved people will have a baptism or a funeral record or a burial record, um, or you know, have a will if you're a free person or buying a property. So we can document um, daily life 
um, you know, find a funeral bill um, or, you know, how many shoes somebody had or what was in their house, you know. So these types of uh, record keeping is, although it's not totally unique to us, I mean, there's other parts of the world that do it, but, you know, my other ancestry that's from North Carolina or Georgia, they'll just say, you're John Smith. And my wife was Sally. They don't, they don't say who Sally's maiden name is, even though that was your wife. Whereas here, they're going to say who your wife was and who her parents were. You know, so you can, on one document, you might get grandparents listed on both sides. So it's, it's, it's a rich place as far as uh, documentation. Again, you would have to know some French or Spanish or, you know, these other languages. But because we're part of that uh, French and Spanish colonial world, it, does, it did give us a little more information about the enslaved population and, you know, where in Africa people were from. So, yeah. So I'd say uh, the project that got me here. <laughs> Okay. Um, since you were talking about record keeping, I have a comment here from Mich Michelle Carter. Uh, she's talking about a friend posted on social media uh, that several of her family members had names that did not match their official birth records. <laughs> <laughs> And so the reason uh, was the births for their African-American family members were not done at hospitals. Uh, these family members were not enslaved and the family members felt no need to get the records changed. I know my mom claims she has two birthdays because she has the birthday her mom says and the birthday that the hospital ha has on her actual birth certificate. So um, could you talk a little bit about perhaps your experiences experiences with with those kind of difficulties and and how you come to resolve that uh those kind of inconsistency in the records well you have to weigh the evidence i mean you have a let's say a an age for a child on a census is one year and then on a tombstone they have a different age on the tombstone which is more likely correct well you know, the, oftentimes the, the date that's earliest, like when they're a child, is probably more accurate than when they were 90 years old and the grandchildren didn't know how old Papa was. <laughs> so they just say, oh, he's about 90. Well, he was 85. So <laughs> you have to weigh the evidence and, and use your your brain to figure out, well, which one is most reliable? Who was the informant who gave that information? Did the person give that information themselves uh, or did someone else give it, let's say on a death certificate, someone who didn't know? So you really have to do some analyzing to look at the different sources that you have, weigh the evidence and see which one is most likely correct or closest to correct. Okay. I'd like to open the floor up to anyone in attendance who would like to ask a question of our researchers here directly, or you can continue to drop them in the chat. But if you'd like could, to- could, unmute could, someone, could someone explain to me on the, uh, the Ancestry websites, when you do the genealogical uh, search and they show you a percentage of ethnicity and race, uh, how, how, that is, uh, how that has arrived because uh, my daughter did it and some of the numbers uh, for her just didn't add up. And then her sister, uh, same mother and father did it and came up with some very different numbers. Hmm. My understanding is, you know, what they've done is they've done genealogical testing, I mean, DNA testing in various areas of Europe, Africa, Asia, and they're looking for certain sequences of DNA that are typical of people who live in those areas. And then they take your DNA and look for those same sequences in your DNA. And then it's sort of statistical average. A lot of it is kind Hello. of educated guesswork as well. So, Hello. I mean, my ethnicity estimates have changed at least three times in the last four years <laughs> in your website. So yeah, it's, 
um, it doesn't beat going back and actually doing the hard work. Um, and I, I tell people like the larger the number, the more likely that that's true. So if you know, you're showing 37% West African and 5% Middle Eastern, you can be pretty sure you're, there's West African and the Middle Eastern may or may not be. So, because mine shows like I'm 2% North African, but I know all my ancestors are German and I figure it's because in you know the year 800, Germanic tribes invaded North Africa and that's how that DNA got in there, so. Yeah. Um, just, I have a, a question if, if, unless someone from any one of our attendees wants to ask a uh, question. Question? Yes. Uh, David, I believe you mentioned that your wife uh, is adopted. So yes. how challenging is it for a person if you're adopted to start your own search to find out who your birth parents are? It varies. Uh, my wife's was actually pretty easy because she matched with someone. She had a, a birth aunt who lives in Zachary, who has a distinctive name. So I was able to use that information to go through obituaries and uh, city directories to locate the family and then deduce from that who her mother was. Okay, so if you have no information and on the birth certificate is the actual birth parents. If you're totally starting from scratch with zero. Uh, the birth parents will not be on the birth certificate of an adoptee. I mean, the adopted parents are on the um, birth. We use the DNA test. That's, okay. that's where I would start. Start with a 23andMe or an Ancestry test because those are the two with the largest databases. And then you can also, the Ancestry at least, you can port your results over to some of the other websites. Um, like find my past, not find my past. Um, family tree DNA. Family tree DNA, the, the other F1. <laughs> um, <laughs> Wait, what was it? Family tree, what was it again? Family tree DNA. They allow you to, you can download your, your results from Ancestry and re upload them to family tree DNA. Um, and then that way you expand, and then you look for people you're closely related to on those sites. The higher the match, the better. And then you try to figure out their family trees, looking for, you know, several, find two or three of those people and try to find a common ancestor for them. And then you can work your way back down to where you are. It's, it's complicated and it can take a long time, um, depending on how close the matches are. Now, if you find somebody who's, you know, a 50% match, and it's your parent, boom, you win. You know, if you find a brother or sister, you know, that's easy. But if, you know, the more distant the matches are, the more difficult it becomes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it, it's, <laughs> there's not one easy answer, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. I have a question in the chat. Any suggestions for finding illegitimate children in families since they may not be listed in the official family records? Um, she's saying, I have heard in, uh, or I have heard in European royal ancestry, the boy children were often named Fitzroy. So, um, you know, if somehow you're related to, to royalty, but maybe your, your line is considered illegitimate. Could you all talk about research methods related to that? Um, there's another DNA uh, testing, it's called the Y DNA. And it's supposed to be your paternal line all the way back a thousand years. But only for men. So, but only for men. <laughs> There's the, the maternal DNA test. You know, you can find out where's your mother's mother's mother from. And that's haplogroup. And that's basically tells you when an ancestor left a certain area you know, we're going back thousands of years. But if you're talking about, it depends on, you're talking about recent history, illegitimacy, 100 years ago, 500 years ago. So the why would be for any period of time going back. Uh, yeah, you, you might find out you have a common male ancestor, but again, it's for males only. Um, and 
I know for Louisiana, uh, children who were born of European fathers uh, many times were listed with the father's names or there were clues to figure out who the father was. And you kind of have to figure out who are the males around who would have had access to a particular woman at the time. So even though you might not get the smoking gun, you can get it down to three, four people, you know, figure out, are they old enough to have this child? Um, you know, particularly in if someone fathered a slave child or uh, at least on Louisiana, it was a lot easier than, and even on my mother's side, um, who are not, they were from North Carolina and Georgia, the father's name was on the death certificate of one of his children who was born by a slave woman. In fact, and her sister was there too. So even though I'd found evidence in the census, I got more confirmation from two death certificates of these two great, great aunts that, yeah, their father was this guy named David Wimberley. So, um, so sometimes it's a little bit hard. Sometimes uh, it's, it's right there. So it sort of just depends. Any additional questions? Just feel free to unmute yourselves. I don't have a question. I just have a, another one of those complicated examples, if you will. Um, I grew up in foster care and I have, um, now I have a birth certificate and my mom, when she had kids, she was married but separated. And so none of the kids except for her first child are really for the man who was her husband on paper. But we all have listed the, the, um, the, the, the man she was married to. And so I always think about how going forward you know, uh, future descendants, if they were to go back and look at my records, uh, what's listed is not accurate. So then I always just think about other people who have similar circumstances. It may not be the same situation, but just those inaccurate records and how they can impact, you know, anybody's search. I have a question. Um, in terms of like the photos, how can they play a role in the genealogy? Because like in my household, we have boxes and boxes of old photos. And of course, a lot of them don't have dates or anything of that. What are, how can they play a role in, in that historical perspective? And what are some ways that we can, um, or resources that we can use, or myself can use to kind of um, digitize them or kind of keep them in a really good collection for future generations to come? Well, the reason I brought up photographs first is like a lot of times people will write on the back, you know, Aunt Martha, 1892, you know, or Aunt Martha and Uncle James, 1890, you know, whatever. So you can sort of, you know, know who these people are in the photographs and put them in a time and a place. Um, but they can also just tell you like who these people were or who these people presented themselves to be, you know, as we do with, with social media or photographs today. If you want to preserve them, we have, we do have here in the library, um, a very nice scanning bed that you can, we can use to, you can use to scan your photographs and we can show you how to use that. And then you can keep them, pass them on, keep them on a flash drive. You know, we do have resources available to help you preserve your materials. So the photographs can be tricky because, you know, what if, if they're just a picture of somebody, you don't know who it is. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I recommend if you have photographs, you know, right now, right on the back of them, if you know who they are, you know, go ahead and do that. So. What, what's a photograph? <laughs> yeah, now. Yeah, everything's on here now. I mean, we don't even have photos anymore, so. Yeah. Well, I know my, my parents' basement, my mom has, you know, photographs going back 150 years from the family. You know, they, my great-grandfather especially was, right in, when photo, photography was new, he would like, you know, every time he got some money together, he would go down to the, the local photography studio, and put on a costume and get his picture taken. And, you know. <laughs> 
So we've got a bunch of those. So, so I mean, there are, if floating in your family somewhere, I hope, you know, pictures, Bibles, letters, accounts that will help, that will help you, you know, piece together who was who and where they were and what they were doing. Hey, we have about four minutes left. If anyone else has a final question. Okay, I've, I've put in the chat uh, the contact information. I can share my screen to show what it looks like. The contact information for the th these three. Yes, um, so I have here the phone, the email address and various sites uh, that that is associated, uh, affiliated with their organizations or their work. Um, hopefully we've, hopefully if you're interested in your genealogy, you'll reach out to one or all of these researchers. And I would just once again, love to thank, like to thank um, Greg, Judy and David for participating in this um, and it's really informative. Louisiana is a very, very unique place uh, in terms of its history compared to uh, the rest of the United States. Uh, so hopefully we've given you through this some things to think about. And uh, be, also, I guess I can put my information in the chat if you wanna reach out to me. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Roveris to close us out. You're on mute, Dr. Rivera's. <laughs> this is my first time using Zoom. I'm not really used to this format. Um, I want to thank you, Ebony, for your work in moderating and hosting and putting this together. Uh, great, great job. Great panel. Um, I was teasing our panelists before we met uh, that if they did a good job, we'd invite them back to our next chat and shoot. If they did a bad job, we wouldn't want to see them again. But we'd love to have you all join us again and again for uh, subsequent chat and shoot uh, opportunities. We'll have various topics and discussions.